All right, good evening, everyone. We are today in the book of Jeremiah, and we are on chapter 5. We're, y'all all can hear me, right? Okay, so I don't have to pick that thing up. So we're on chapter 5. Um, so before we get started, as usual, we're going to pray, and then we'll get right into our uh, lesson today. So uh, let us pray. Lord God, we would like to thank you for allowing us to live to see this brand new day that you have blessed us to be alive and useful in your kingdom. We thank you for waking us up this morning and for keeping us throughout this day. We thank you for the many blessings you have bestowed upon us, Lord, and for allowing us to turn those blessings into blessings for others. We thank you, Lord, for choosing us and using us to be your vessels, representing you here on this, your created earth. We thank you for providing for us by giving us our daily bread, and we thank you for protecting us by keeping our hurt, harm, and dangers away from us. We thank you for your grace, Lord, which is new every day. And we thank you for your mercy, which allows us to see another day. Lord God, we offer ourselves to you as living and holy sacrifices. And we pray that the work that we do in your honor is pleasing to you. Because we do it all for your glory and not our own. We love you, we adore you, and we magnify your most holy name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So again, we are at Jeremiah chapter 5, and she's going to begin, and she being Trivia Jones is our reader tonight. (laughs) She's going to begin by reading verses 1 through 9. So Jeremiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. And remember, If you see any slides that you want to get, uh, just write it down. Let me know so I can get them back to you so that I won't. I started to make slides, and I was like, I'm just randomly making all these slides, and they may not want them, so I won't be wasting paper. Just let me know. Write it down on a piece of paper which slides you want, so you don't have to sit there and write all this stuff down that you see. Just let me know which slides you want. So we're going to get started. She's going to read verses 1 through 9. Jeremiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. Roam through the streets of Jerusalem, look and take note, search in her squares. If you find a single person, anyone who acts justly, who seeks to be faithful, then I will forgive her. When they say, as the Lord lives, they are swearing falsely. Lord, don't your eyes look for faithfulness? You have struck them, but they felt no pain. You finished them off, but they refused to accept discipline. They made their faces harder than rock, and they refused to return. Then I thought, they are just the poor. They have played the fool, but they don't understand the way of the Lord, the justice of their God. I will go to the powerful and speak to them. Surely they know the way of the Lord, the justice of their God. However, these also have broken the yoke and torn off the fetters. Therefore, a lion from the forest will strike them down. A wolf from an arid plain will ravage them. A leopard keeps watch over their cities. Anyone who leaves them will be torn to pieces because their rebellious acts are many. Their unfaithful deeds numerous. Why should I forgive you? Your children have abandoned me and sworn by those who are not gods. I satisfied their need, yet they committed adultery. They gash themselves at the prostitute's house. They are well-fed, eager stallions, each neighing after someone else's wife. Should I not punish them for these things? This is the Lord's declaration. Should I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? Wow, that was a lot being said. So what I want to ask you to do is like what I ask in other classes and other things. I want you to start, when you're reading your Bible, when you're reading your words, some of you already know what I'm going to (laughs) say. Look at words that stand out to you. Highlight them. Highlight them. Underline them. Highlight the things that stand out to you. I also want you to start highlighting and looking at the words that, you know where it says, uh, on this day. Uh, um, On this day, but, you know, little words like that, contraction words and stuff things that are going to stand out, things that are going to make that whole sentence change, you know, and stuff. Look for that, and then look for the questions. You know, she just asked several questions in this reading 
to see if you can figure out, you know, let God help you figure out what's the answer to these questions. Because this is Bible study. So you're not in it just to read it. You're in it to study it and to try to understand what God is saying to us today. So look for those words when you're reading. You know, anything that stands out to you. Don't just look for a word because, ooh, that sounds good. A word that, <laughs> a word that stands out that God just brings out for you to, uh, to, to see, you know, a sentence, you know, the phrase, you know, something that stands out to you. And then what you end up doing as you continue to do this, you'll notice that you'll start being curious about it and you're going to start researching. You're going to start researching, like, why was that said? And what does he mean by, you know, like the phrase we looked at this last week, although they say, as the Lord lives, you know. So it'll be like, why does that stand out, as the Lord lives? What is that? That's like an oath, you know. So that kind of stuff, it'll make you start, you know, really looking at Because she just read, it was a lot in this that she just read. It was a lot. So in order to understand it, we, we, we pray for understanding before we get into it, but we also need to start looking at these and looking at these words. So prior to verse number 15 of this chapter, there is more discussion of the reasons for the coming judgment. We know that a judgment is coming. As we have seen, Israel's rejection of the sovereignty of God and of his covenant was the basic cause for God's judgment. So that's why God was coming on for them. They rejected God and they rejected this covenant that, they, that their ancestors had made you know, for them, and this, this, this was a generational covenant that he had made several covenants with them, too. So once Israel abandoned God and acknowledged their idolatry, it was inevitable that the curses of the covenant would soon become operative. So even if the people did not acknowledge or see this, Jeremiah understood the painful truth. And remember, Jeremiah, you know, he was the one that was controversial because they didn't want to hear what Jeremiah was saying. They were mad at Jeremiah. They didn't want to hear all this. Jeremiah was, com was coming at them talking about judgment. So they didn't want that. So in verses 1 through 9, both God, which is what she just read, trivia just read, in verses 1 through 9, both God and Jeremiah are the spokesmen. So you, both of them are speaking, interchangeable in that. And then in verses um, 1 and 2, God is the spokesman. In verses, so in verses 1 through 9, both God and Jeremiah. But in verses 1 and 2, God is the spokesman. In verses 3 and 6, or 3 through 6, Jeremiah is the spokesperson. And then in verses 7 through 9, God is the spokesperson. So a question that can be asked in this chapter is, can these people be forgiven? And so and things like that is what you, I want you to look for. You know, like I was just saying, look, who's, who's speaking? You know, when you're reading, who's saying what? Who's saying this? And so in this, in this little interchange, we've seen just in verses 1 through 9, we've seen God saying, you know, we've talked about thus says the Lord, you know, and then we have Jeremiah speaking as his spokesman because he was a prophet speaking for God. So those are the kind of things you look for when you're interpreting. You know, we're just not here to read the Bible. We're here to study the Bible, and we want to understand what is God saying. So the people are invited to search specifically in, Jer in, in Jerusalem's open places and streets for one single man who acts justly and seeks after faithfulness or truth. So Jeremiah is asking, you know, who is this? What is, who is this man? If you can find one person, you know, this is what God is saying, you know, telling them you can find one person <laughs> that speaks rightly, that speaks justly, that speaks in truth. So they're, they're, if they could find one person, then maybe, just maybe, God will hold up on that judgment. Don't that sound familiar? <laughs> the combination of justice and faithfulness is one that should characterize a man who is faithful to the covenant. So they're looking for somebody that's faithful, somebody that knows the Lord and somebody that believes in him. Because back then, remember, these people stopped believing. So they're looking for a just, a just person. There are two words that denote covenant, covenantal uh, qualities which govern the relationship between man and God and between men and men. So there are two words. Those two words are righteousness and faithfulness. So they're looking for a man who is rightful, who, who, who's, you know, who, is, who, uh, who is righteous and who's faithful. If a single man with these qualities would have been found, God would have forgiven the city. If a single person, and we're talking about Judah, all them folks, 
Comparison can be made, of course, with Genesis chapter 18, verses 23 through 32, when in the days of Abraham, God would have spared Sodom and Gomorrah for 10 men. God offers easier terms to Jerusalem. Right now, he's offering easier terms, even though Jerusalem's sins exceeded those of Sodom. Because you remember what Sodom, Sodom you know, and Gomorrah's sins were. Well, with, with this one, they're blaming God for all the evil stuff. They're worshiping idols. You know, they're doing a lot more than what they were doing back in Sodom's day. And <laughs> God was saying, I forgive the whole city. You can just find me one person. And they couldn't even do that. Ezekiel chapter 16, verse number 48 reads, As I live, says the Lord God, our system Sodom and her daughters have not done as you and your daughters have done. Ezekiel, you know, telling, telling Jerusalem this. As I live, says the, Lord, your, says the Lord God. And remember, Ezekiel was a prophet, so God is speaking through Ezekiel to his people. And that's why he's saying, as I live. Remember those words, as I live, you know, uh, says the Lord. That's when we know God is speaking. Our sister Sodom and her daughters have done, have not done as you and your daughters have done. So that Jerusalem, wow, did more or worse than Sodom. And of course, they denied God. They rejected God. They rejected the covenant. So yes, they, they had. So we discussed the term and the meaning of the phrase, as the Lord lives, last week. We discussed how important it is that when we make an oath, invoking the Lord, that we make sure that we fulfill that oath. Verse number three asks, O Lord, do your eyes not look for truth? Do your eyes not look for truth? To be sure, the eyes of God are directed toward faithfulness. To swear by God is to invoke his name as the guarantor of any obligation which a man may take upon himself. That's why last week we said you do not just tell somebody, oh, I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to do that because that is you telling somebody. You're gonna, they're looking for it. They're expecting it, you know. So we don't do that, and we don't promise somebody something. We don't swear somebody something if we're not going to do it. If you know you're not going to do it, do not do it. Do not tell them that. <laughs> because even if they let you out of it, God is not going to let you out of it. If God is still looking for you because you said, you know, you're swearing on his name. So you're holding God to this, too. So that's why you shouldn't say, even in, in jest, you know, you should not say, oh, I promise you this, or I promise you that. Do not do that. <laughs> Do that, do that. So in the event of a breach of that contract, God would be expected to visit the covenant breaker with judgment. So you're going to be judged for that. God is going to pay you a visit. <laughs> when a man who is faithful to God make an oath, he is expected to complete it. He's expected to complete it. Israel had broken her covenant and the curses of the broken covenant had fallen on them. That's why they were going through so much. They were constantly breaking these covenants or God's covenant. They were constantly, you know, just saying they were going to do this. They were going to do that. They were going to do that. They were promising each other stuff. They were promising other men stuff. And they were breaking, oh, you know, even we're going to get to where even the priests um, and some false prophets were making promises to the people and were breaking them, you know, just for the gain, financial gain for themselves. So God himself had visited them in judgment. That's why they're about to go through what they're about to go through. The concluding verse in verse number three, or uh, verse number three, it reads, you have struck them, but they felt no, no anguish. You have consumed them, but they refused to take correction. They have made their faces harder than rock. They have refused to turn back. So normally, one is expected to learn a lesson and mend their ways when they have been punished. You know, when you get punished, you're going to learn a lesson. You're not going to do that no more. You're going to, you know, you're going to, Hopefully you're not going to do that no more and you're going to figure out I shouldn't be doing this because you've been punished. And that's, you know, when you break a contract or when you break a promise or when you break, you know, when you tell somebody something, that was the divine uh, uh, intention. That was, that was what was intended. 
Jerusalem refused to turn back to God. So that was that was you know that was the, the, a divine thing when God uh, when God and because we talked about it before back in Genesis when he talked about when you're making a promise and how you're supposed to keep with that promise. So you're like I said, you're invoking God in that when you're saying that. So he's expecting you to fulfill that promise. And when you don't, then since it was a, a promise, an oath, where you uh, invoke God in it, then he's going to have, you're going to, you're, you're about to, you will get a divine intervention. <laughs> and you will receive a divine judgment against you. <laughs> you know, um, and verse number four, those who were poor, uh, uh, or when it talks about Jeremiah said, uh, then I said, these are only the poor. They have no sense for they do not know the way of the Lord, the law of their God. So it makes you wonder. I mean, look at that verse. It said, these are only the poor. They have no sense. Poor people have sense. <laughs> That's why I said when you're reading it, you're really reading it, read it. And it's like, what do you mean? You know, they don't have any sense. Poor people have sense. We have sense. We have more sense than the rich people. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, but they do not know the way of the Lord, the law of their God. Wasn't Jesus poor? So poor people have sense. They, you know, they know, they, they know. But, so we have to make you wonder when you're reading that, when you read, read that it should be, uh, what does he mean? Who are the poor people? Who are the poor? What is he talking about? Could it be that they were the citizens of Jerusalem? who were insensitive to God's punishment and they were unable and unwilling to read the signs of the times because of their preoccupation with their own affairs, which required them to enter into agreements with an appropriate oath. So it's not that these people are, you know, you know, some of them are going to be poor, but it's not that they're, he's saying that, all these, these people are so poor, you know, that they, they, they don't have anything. He's saying like, you know, like all oh, these poor people, you know, like that, not because they're in poverty, but because he's saying all oh, these poor people, because he knows of the judgments that's coming their way. You see what I'm saying? That's why he's saying these poor people. He knows what's coming their way. So it's not because he's looking at them as being somebody, you know, in, in that's poverty, that's what, impoverish, yeah, that are, that are just, you know, don't have anything. Because a rich person could be a poor person. No, oh, this poor person, because he's going to face this judgment too. So he's talking about them. He's not talking about financial. So uh, there was no intention on their part to submit their lives and their business dealings to God's scrutiny. And that's why, because that's why he was saying these poor people, you know, like that way, not because they don't have things. Because like I just said, rich people can be considered poor people too if they don't understand stuff that they don't know. So you're just going to be saying, oh, them poor people, they just da-da-da-da-da. And that's what he's saying. That's what that, that, what that is uh, intended for. They hardly believed that God would care because God was not in their thoughts or in their hearts. Remember we talked, I think, what, last week or the week before about uh, being God's being. You know how we always say that phrase, God knows my heart. God knows my heart. We talk about circumcision. That was dealing with circumcision when Jeremiah was talking about circumcision and circumcision of the heart. So despite Josiah's, remember Josiah's reformation, which removed, and Je Je Josiah's reformation, which removed the outward signs of false worship and swept the house of Judah, the house was empty. So Luke chapter 11, verses 24 through 25 says this. Once, you know, and this is, you no know, Josiah's Reformation, again, removed the outward signs of false worship, which means, you know, false worship, outward signs going up, worshiping those false idols. Now, we talked about that already when he did, when, when that was, that's what that meant. So Josiah was saying we should not be doing that. We should be worshiping God in truth in the temple the way we're supposed to be doing. So that was Josiah's Reformation. Get rid of these outward signs of y'all going up on this hill. No, won't everybody see you all worship the Baals and the Astaroth. So Luke chapter 11, verses 24 and 25 reads, When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it wanders through waterless regions looking for a resting place, but not finding any. It says, I will return to my house from which I came. When it comes, it finds it swept and put in order. The true religion of the citizens of Jerusalem was very shallow. 
It was very shadow. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 4 reads, Do not trust in these deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. You're going to understand that in a few minutes. <laughs> to them, God was a God who was concerned primarily with his temple and its purity. There was protection for the people who lived in the shadow of the temple. But the people knew nothing about true religion and wholehearted commitment. Because remember, these people have turned their backs on God. They have turned their backs on God. So they're just faking it to make it, as we say. What is that? Faking it to make it. That's all. That's what they're doing. Because they're Israelites. They figure that we just going to, like, like they can fool God. That's what they're thinking they're doing. We're just faking it to make it. So we're going to go to this temple and we're, gonna, you know, we're just going to do it because it's supposed to be done. We're just going to carry this out because it's supposed to be carried out. So we're just going to worship here. But remember, they were also going up on that hill worshiping those bells. So they was like both ways straddling that fence. Yeah, lukewarm and all that kind of stuff. They were trying to do like they could fool God. <laughs> you know, like God did not know their hearts. So the, uh, the leaders are the great ones, uh, and, and they were men of high stations. Those rich people are described as those who understood the way of God. But in contrast to the poor who were ignorant and insensitive, these are described as men who have broken the yokes and burst the, the uh, bonds. This is, again, as we have seen, a picture of rebellion. We've talked about that, a picture of rebellion and defiance and seems to have in mind, we talked about, I think, this last week about that ox who is normally yoked to his plow and draws the plow with the aid of its traces. Whatever the Reformation achieved externally, it did not touch the lives of the great ones, those rich people. So what Josiah was trying to do with this, with, with this uh, Reformation it did not matter to these rich people because they still felt that they can go up on that hill and worship those false gods. So whatever it achieved, it did not achieve what he wanted it to do. And that's what Jer Jeremiah was trying to uh, preach to them so deeply that they accepted the yoke of allegiance to God and his covenant gladly. So they did not care. They didn't care. They didn't know God, but they were faking it. Remember, they were faking it so that the <laughs> oppress the people they were oppressing would believe them. So they were faking it. And that's not right, but that's what they that's what these leaders, and remember the leaders are the officials, the kings, the princes, P-R-I-N-C-E-S, and the officials. Priests, you know, all those, some, some prophets, because we had some false prophets. These were the people leaders. So they were faking it. They were faking a lot because all they wanted to do was to continue to get this money that they were getting from the people or continue to have them bring them because, hey, I'm your leader. I'm, I'm, I'm your priest. Bring me this. Bring me that because I'm your priest. So they were living good because the people were bringing them stuff all the time and they wanted to continue to live in that lifestyle. So they were just saying stuff like, uh, this is the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. And we're going to see that when we get there, how they were doing all that. You know, they were just saying stuff. They were what, tickling their ears, so to speak, or saying what they wanted them to say or what they figured that these people want to hear, you know, trying to make them happy, trying to serve them. Like we have pastors and preachers and other people and speakers that do that today. I'm going to say what you want me to say. You know, I'm going to say what you want me to say because you're going to bring the tithes to the storehouse if I do that. Not because you're doing it because God is saying, you're just doing this because, hey, I'm tickling your ear. I'm going to tell you what you want to hear. You know, so that was that. But in, it, it appears that they, in fact, rejected the covenant because they did. They rejected the covenant so that the curses of the covenant would fall on them. And it did. But what they did were they were still, these were the people with the, with the power, with the money, the priests, the prophets, the kings and all that that uh, were breaking, you know, like I said, telling them one thing, telling them over here and doing over here, telling over here, talking about it over here, but doing over here. Or I'm going to tell you like this, but I'm going to live like this. That's what, and that's what we have going on today. 
but that's what they were doing back then. So it didn't start today. Nothing new is under the sun. It didn't stop today. They were already doing this. They were doing it back then. <laughs> you know, I'm going to tell you what I want you to hear. So in verse number six, Jeremiah uses symbolism of attacks of wild animals to describe the consequences of breaching the contract. So these wild animals are the invaders referred to in chapters four and then also chapter six. So we read about these wild animals before. We are reminded again of a rebellious ox with a broken yoke who has, who has escaped his owner. Now the ox has not only escaped the owner, but he also escaped from the owner's protection. So when you got away from the owner, when he ran away from the owner, he lost that protection. When he turned his back on his owner, he lost that protection. When we turn our backs on God, we lose that protection. So when the Israelites turned their backs on God, they lost their protection. So that leaves him, that leaves him open, this ox, that leaves him open to attacks by a lion from the forest, by the wolves from the desert or the arid places, or prowling leopards. They leave him open for all those attacks. The ox who left the protection of his owner will suffer a fate like God's people who wandered away from God's protection. All who wander away from God's protection will be torn in pieces. They will be torn in pieces. So when you walk away from him, when you walk away from God, you're leaving yourself open uh, to <laughs> lions, wolves, leopards, and the verse also says, verse number six, everyone who goes out of them or out of his protection shall be torn in pieces because their transgressions are many. Hmm. Verse number six reminds us that um, the rebellious deeds of God's people had been many. It says because their transgressions are many. Their, 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 those rebellious deeds, those transgressions were many and their backsliding had been countless. So, and we know that, you know, we think about that, just think about judges, how they would do what God wants them to do and live in peace with these judges. And then as soon as the judge die, and they'll be so filthy so for so many years, 20, 30 years. And once that judge die or whatever, they go right on back into that sin and they were doing. Then they got to cry out to God again, Lord, help us. You know, he would raise up another judge and they would do good for a while and 10, 20 years while that judge living. And as soon as that judge die, they go back to their old way. Then they got to cry out again. And it was just a cycle that was going on, a cycle that started way back with Samuel and ended with Samson. So there was like a cycle that they had going on throughout that. So this what verse six reminds us of the, the covenant had been broken and rejected by the people. With no sign of repentance, judgment is inedible. And uh, De Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 15 through 46, describes all this in more detail. So if you want to go back and read, remind yourself and stuff, you can go back and read Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 15 through 46. And it talks about, you know, the judgment and what's going to happen if you did this and God said do this and you, you don't be, you, you be disobedient when he says be obedient, stuff is going to happen. So verses 7 through 9 ask three questions. How can I pardon you? Shall I not punish them for these things? And shall I not bring retribution on a nation such as this? So you notice in these verses that the leaders still swore by God that there were no gods and that they still visited the harlot's houses. Yeah, verses, look at verse number nine. And it asks them, uh, uh, well, go back to verse number seven, seven through nine. But it asks, they still, they, uh, verse number seven tells them that and I have sworn by those who are no God. So they swear by those idols. You know, because they believe in it. They, they're, they're, they're swearing by the idols because the idols are not God. So, and that's because they're believing in the God, but they want to they wanna fool the people of Israel. You know, like, we're swearing by your God. We're going by God, you know, the God of Israel. We're going by our God, because they're supposed to be leaders now. We're going by our God. But in the meantime, they're still worshiping those false idols. So they're still doing all those, yeah, the false idols. They're still doing, doing that. And they're also still visiting the harlot's house. They're still going up to see the prostitutes. 
you know, they're still being, they're still more or less prostituting themselves out because they're doing the things that they wanted to do. And remember, so, um, we still had temple prostitutes and that's who they were visiting. So they were still doing all this stuff that they didn't have any business doing because they just wanted to be, they, it was pleasure to them. And they liked that. So they were still doing all this stuff that they were not supposed to be doing. So Jeremiah asked these three questions. So the first of these, where the leaders still swore by gods that were no gods, may have been what Ezekiel saw in his vision of the activities being perpetrated in the temple. So when we get to Ezekiel, we're going to see that. When God's people forsook him, he ceased to be regarded by them as the guarantor of their oath, and his place was usurped by these no gods. By these no gods. So, and that were the idols. So despite the reforms of Josiah, and y'all remember Josiah re <laughs> reform, uh, it was a spiritual reform. It was initiated by King Josiah, and what he did was he sought to rid the Israelites' faith and practice of the pagan rituals that had been introduced in the past year. So he was trying to correct all this wrong that they had been doing. So worship was purified and centralized into the temple in Jerusalem. He's trying to get them to come back to the temple in Jerusalem. Stop going to Dan. Stop going to Bethel. Let's all go where we're supposed to be going, where the God directed us to go, was to Jerusalem. Not to Dan, not to Bethel, Bethel because they were closer to you. We need to be going to Jerusalem. So that's what he's trying. That's what Josiah was trying to get King Josiah was trying to get them to do. So shrines and sanctuaries and outlying areas were closed. He, during his time, when he did his reformation, he closed all that where they were going up doing the bells and all that. So but this time was only short lived because the spiritual reform died when Josiah or uh, with Josiah when he died and he was killed in battle against the Egyptians. So once he died, that was it. His son took over, and then they killed him. <laughs> and then somebody else took over, and, of course, they killed him all the way down until they got to Jehoshaphat, who did what the people wanted him to do. So, uh, and then Manasseh, you remember King Manasseh? He was really, really bad, too. So his apostasy, because he turned his back on God. King Manasseh, he turned his back on God. So, and then the second part of that was, is that they lingered at the harlot's house, even though God satisfied them and gave them all that they needed. So even though God provided for them and everything, they still lingered at the harlot's house. This is a reminder of Gomer, the wife of Hosea, who went after her lovers, refusing to recognize that her husband had provided her with all she needed. So... This time, what Jeremiah, no, he was giving us all these symbols. The last time, he did a symbol, a, a symbol of the attack with the wild animals. Well, we just looked at the lions and, y'all know I want to say lions and tigers and bears, right? Oh, wow. <laughs> you know that's what I want to say. But I'm going to say the lions and the woods and the leopards. <laughs> so, but, that, but, but we looked at that. So now this time, he's turned it to where he's wanting us to see um, the symbol of God and his sinful people because the people were sinful. And that's why he's using, he's saying that they're still going up to the harlot's house. So verse number eight says that they were well-fed, lusty stallions, each neighing for his neighbor's wife. There was a sexual aspect to religion throughout the Fertile Crescent, although the goddesses of fertility played a much greater role among the Canaanites than among any other ancient people. Sacred prostitution accompanied worship in their cult practices in Phoenicia and Syria. You know, we've already talked about that, how they worship in the temple and uh, with the uh, temple prostitutes and how they were part of that ritual under the trees and stuff in the valleys were sexual practices. So the, and, and it was all for, uh, in their minds because of the fertility they were worshiping having sex and doing this for the fertility uh, gods. So cult prostitution was widely practiced in the days of King Manasseh. So this is after Josiah's reform had died and his son had died and stuff. And later on when Manasseh took over, this is what he was really, they had really gotten into cult prostitution. What had begun in the sanctuaries continued in the brothels. 
And the same women who had been put out of business by the reforms found a new means of livelihood. So they got back to work. <laughs> Even though fornication, uh, and, and, and I think everybody knows fornication is sexual relations between a man and an unmarried woman, is regarded in the Old Testament as blindness to true values and true manhood, and is the result of deeper sin evils, it does not seem to have been regarded in the same way as adultery, which was held to be a most grievous sin, and it was punishable by death. Yeah, poor woman. It was a destruction of the covenant basis of the family and society, and that's why they looked at it, you know, more harshly than they did fornication, because it's messing up. You know, when you look at adultery, it's hurting the family. It's hurting society. So that's the difference. And, you know, you have the adultery and you have fornication. And fornication would be like an unmarried, you know, person or an unmarried, uh, yeah, an unmarried person. They were not married. So my, most of the time, nine times out of ten, they didn't have a family. They didn't have, well, of course, they didn't have a wife if they weren't married, but they didn't have like a wife and children living at home that they're messing up the whole house when you did with adultery. So that's why they treated adultery much more harshly than they did fornication. And that's why you had those temple prostitutes that were just laying up doing it all the time because they were not going to be punishable. No, they were not facing punishment by death. So such evils could not escape divine visitation because God would take vengeance on the entire nation. Divine judgment was the inevitable consequence of defiance of God and an open revolt against the covenant. So, and, and we've talked more about that, I think, a couple of weeks ago. So now when you read verses 10 through 19, They, the house of Israel and the house of Judah, have dealt very treacherously with me. This is the Lord's declaration. They have contradicted the Lord and insisted it won't happen. Harm won't come to us, and we won't see sword or famine. The prophets become only wind, for the Lord's word is not in them. This will, in fact, happen to them. Therefore, this is what the Lord God of hosts says. Because you have spoken this word, I am going to make my words become fire in your mouth. These people are the wood, and the fire will consume them. I am about to bring a nation from far away against you, house of Israel. This is the Lord's declaration. It is an established nation, an ancient nation, a nation whose language you do not know, whose speech you do not understand. Their quiver is like an open grave. They are all mighty warriors. They will consume your harvest and your food. They will consume your sons and your daughters. They will consume your flocks and your herds. They will consume your vines and your fig trees. They will destroy with the sword your fortified cities in which you trust. But even in those days, this is the Lord's declaration, I will not finish you off. When the people ask, for what offense has the Lord our God done all these things to us? You will respond to them. Just as you abandoned me and served foreign gods in your land, so will you serve strangers in a land that is not yours. Wow. How many times did God have to tell them that? <laughs> How many times? So in verses 10 through 14, a terrible judgment was on Judah because of her faithlessness to God. And her complacency is announced. So in verses 15 through 17, the enemy from the north will bring judgment. It's described right there. We just heard her read that. And so in verse number 10, an invitation is extended by God to some unspecified destroyer to go through the vine rows in God's vineyard, which is Judah to prune away branches which do not belong to God. God permits an enemy to undertake a severe pruning 
of his choice vines now become a degener degenerate <laughs> wild vine. So a rank growth was to be torn away. Although the vine itself was not going to be completely destroyed. So he wasn't going to completely destroy him, but he was going to hurt him. He was gonna hurt, they were going to feel that hurt. They were going to know that they'd been warned. Uh, they, were, they, they were going to, God was going to allow them to feel what he wanted them to feel because they were being, they were so disobedient. They were going to know that God had been there. They were going to know that, that, that he was there. So in verses number 11 through 13, the charge was clear. Both Israel and Judah, both of them, had been faithless. In verse number 12, the people had spoken falsely about God and declared that God would do nothing. Oh, they were arrogant now. <laughs> no evil will come upon us and we shall not see a sword or a famine. So this was, this was, was like blind complacency. The people forgot that breach of contract or the breach of, the breach of a covenant will result in the operation of the curses of the covenant or divine judgment. They were beside themselves. They got arrogant, you know, because believe, right now they didn't believe in God. You know, they talked like they did, but they really didn't. So they didn't care. They were like, okay, what is he going to do to us? He's not going to do anything. <laughs> they deluded themselves into thinking that somehow the God of the covenant would overlook the breaches of the covenant. So the people were perhaps led into this complacency by the words of the false prophets who were saying that misfortune would not overtake them. Oh, it ain't going to happen. It's not going to happen to us. That's too harsh. That's too bad. God is not a God like that. So that's not going to happen. So if you look at verse number 13, the prophets are nothing but when, for the word is not in them. That's what it says. Verse number 13 says the prophets are nothing but when, for the word is not in them. So, <laughs> The true word of God is shown to be with Jeremiah, Jeremiah, who spoke on behalf of the God of hosts. Israel was seen as an army battling for God and the establishment of his kingdom. So it was in the name of this God that Jeremiah spoke in a day when the men of Judah had ceased to distinguish God's true servant from the prophets of Baal. So Jeremiah stated that the words of the other prophets were only wind. They were just talking. So this is Jeremiah talking about those false prophets now. God's word was not in them. So he was just letting them know. These people are telling y'all this stuff, but they're not speaking for God. You know, these are false prophets. So he's telling that. So verse number 13, what, and remember Jeremiah is speaking on God's behalf. So verse number 14, 14 states, I am now making my words in your mouth a fire and that did, <laughs> I am now making my words in your mouth a fire and this people would. And the fire, the fire shall devour them. So Jeremiah's prophetic oracles were like fire in his mouth. And the nation was as wood, which would be consumed in the encounter. <laughs> so God, you know, I, I mean, Jeremiah is like speaking on God's behalf, but God is almost, God is getting like weary of these people. You know, he's getting tired of these people. In verses 15 and 16, the invader is still not identified. So we still don't know. He's still not identified, clearly. The nation in question is ancient, enduring, speaking an unknown tongue. They're alien in culture and in religion. And they are also referred to as almighty warriors. Their arrows are deadly. Uh, and it says their quiver is like an open tomb or a grave. So in verse number 17, the outcome of the invasion is shown in graphic language, which is both realistic and authentic. So you got harvest and food, floods and herds, vines and fig trees, sons and daughters, everything, everybody will be destroyed. Even the fortified cities, we talked about those fortified cities and those fortified walls last week in which they trusted would be demolished. So even those fortified cities will not be able to save them. So verse 18 and 19 are in prose. Remember that? See that? You see that they're written in prose form now. We've went from uh, a poetry to prose. 
They're in probes, and they make the point again that although the devastation caused by the enemy would be great, this would not be the complete finish of the nation. And you see that at verse number 18 where it says, but even in those days, says the Lord, I will not make a full end of you. So he's not through with him yet. He's not through with him yet. It's not their, their destruction is not all the way complete. Can you read? Let's finish it on up. 20 through 31. What will you do when the end time comes? What will you do when the end? So if you notice that these verses, what we just said earlier, they were that we went from poetic to genre to, to the prose. Now we back at poetic. So we went from poetic to prose and now back at poetic. They reflect the folly and the unnatural behavior of a people who rebelled against God and they do not reverence God anymore and they do not even acknowledge that God is the source of their life. They have totally rejected God. They have become just that arrogant, you know. So their crimes are detailed and there is shock at the behavior of the religious leaders, the prophets, and the priests because they're all acting up. In verse number 20, God addresses the nation through his spokesman, Jeremiah. And then in verse number 21, a foolish and senseless people are requested to listen. God's people were insensitive to the many evidence of God's lordship and power. They were ignoring him. They, they, <laughs> they were rejecting him. They rejected him. So Jeremiah called out the people. He called out the people for not discerning God's control of nature and history, as well as his power to visit his people in judgment because they didn't believe God was going to do anything to them. So they were like, they didn't care. They didn't believe in him. They didn't think that he was powerful. They didn't believe. So of course they didn't believe that he was going to rain down some type of judgment on them. And all the evidence that was going out, when remember they, were, they, they had a drought, they had different things, they had famine, all this stuff that was going out. Plus they knew the stories of their ancestors. They knew the stories, but they still had changed because they liked the, the pleasure, the life they were living and stuff. These uh, the priests and the prophets and the kings and stuff had convinced the people, you know, and then they were oppressing the people. But they had convinced the people to listen to them to even though they were spewing out uh, false, false thieves and all this kind of stuff. And then they were also living like they were trying to, you know, they were fooling them like I'm living this way but I'm speaking over here, but y'all don't see this over here that I'm doing because I'm leaving, I'm, I, when I'm in front of you, I'm doing this right here, so y'all gonna believe this right here. 
So that's the kind of stuff they were seeing, all this deception. There were a lot of deception going on, and the people were believing it. So God addresses, he talks to them, and remember, these people are not liking Jeremiah because Jeremiah is just telling them what God is saying. So they're like, they're, 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 they're upset with Jeremiah. That's why, remember, Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet because he was, he was getting grief all the time. Because remember last week, we determined that he did not sugarcoat his message at all. He always said, what well, thus says the Lord. No matter what, and no matter what they, how they talked about him, no matter how they were ridiculing him, no matter what they did to him, no, he still said, what well, thus says the Lord. Because he refused to live and, and, and live like the other kings and those false prophets and all that. He refused to give them what their ears want to hear. You know, he told them what thus said the Lord. So, uh, and the people got mad, the, the, uh, the, the prophets and all those others, a lot of those people, they got mad with him. And so what he's saying is they have eyes but sees nothing. They have ears and they hear nothing. They were listening, but they were not receiving. They didn't care. The phrase is repeated often. This phrase where they have eyes and see nothing, ears and hear nothing, what she just read, this phrase is repeated often in the Israelites' history because they chose to ignore God many, many, many times. You can see it over in like Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, Matthew chapter 13, verses 14 and 15, John chapter 12, verse 40, and then Acts chapter 28, verse 26. So, not just in Old Testament is it being said, eyes, you know, eyes are not seeing and ears are not hearing, but you also see it in the New Testament as well. So the, and we talked about this, I think, a little bit last week, the stupidity and senselessness of the people consisted in the fact that they did not reverence God or tremble in his presence. They, they had stopped remembering, I think we talked about that last week, they did not reverence God anymore. Because they didn't believe in him. <laughs> Even though they blamed him for all this stuff that was happening to him, to them, they blamed him for the bad stuff. But they worshiped those idol gods for the good things that were going on in their lives. But uh, they did show reference to those other deities like Baal, Asheroth, and Chemosh. And they simply chose to ignore God. So this insensitiveness was incomprehensible since it was God who controlled the mighty seas. In creation, God set bounds to the waters and set apart the dry land. You can see that over in Genesis chapter 1, verses 6 through 20, when God was created. You also see it at Job chapter 38, verses 8 through 11. And you also see it in Psalms 104, verses 5 through 9. But then Job, which is my favorite one, uh, chapter 38, verses 8 through 11 reads, Or who shuts in the sea with doors when it bursts out from the womb? When I made the clouds, its garment and thick darkness, its swaddling band, and prescribed bounds for it, and set bars and doors and said, Thus far shall you come and no further, and here shall your proud waves be stopped. That's because God controls all that. He decided where the water stopped how far it should go out, when should it stop. Have you ever wondered or thought about, you know, it, there's a boundary right there. That water will not come back any further. And God set that boundary for that sea. So the sea is like stopped right there. You know, it's just like, just comes up and it stopped right there. That's a miracle, you know, because, you know, I mean, and God set all that. And so Job, and Job, he asked that question, you know, when Job was like, uh, you know, was questioning God. And then God just said, you know, can you do all this? Can you do this? Who are you that you can? Can you do this? Can you do that? So the law that the sand should make the bounds of the sea was an everlasting decree, which the mighty seas were unable to transgress. The waves may toss and heave, but they are powerless. The billows may roar, but they cannot cross the sand barrier. That's what she just read. These words may reveal some fear that the people of Israel had for the sea. They still carry the strong assurance that the thing they feared had no power over them because it was in the control of God. 
So they, 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 they didn't care about it. They felt that, you know, they didn't believe in God and all that. They knew that seed was powerful. You know, we know a lot of stuff that, that I mean, we have common sense. We know stuff, too. But we still, <laughs> and most of the time, credit it to ourselves instead of crediting it to God. You know, so, and we still do, as, as the word called them last week, stupid things. These people were stupid. They would do stupid things. They knew, they felt, they were there. They knew God did all this stuff. They knew God was the creator. They knew this. They had been taught this from the beginning. They knew it was their ancestors. But yet, they chose otherwise. What Baal could not control, God could. But they believe in these deities. What Baal could not control, God could. They knew. Remember Elijah, <laughs> you know, and, and, and those prophets. And, and, and when they, he told them to bring fire, you know, uh, set their wood on fire, and then they couldn't. And then Elijah took it and wet it all up and put this much water and dig a ditch and make sure it's soaked and all this. And God <laughs> made that fire come. So... They, but get Baal couldn't, Baal, uh, uh, what Baal could not control, you know, God, of course, he could control. That's why it was crazy that the people did not recognize God and give him the reference that he so deserved from them. So even though the seas, even though the seas recognize their bounds set by an everlasting decree, Israel recognized no master. Isaiah chapter one, verse three reads, the ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib. But Israel does not know. My people do not understand. And that's Isaiah chapter 1, verse 3. The people had a rebellious and defiant heart. They turned aside, and they went their own way. So in other words, they broke the barriers set by the covenant, barriers that were voluntarily accepted by their forefathers. Exodus 19, 4 through 8 reads, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the people. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. So Moses came, summoned the elders of the people, and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. The people answered all at once, everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. So Moses went back and reported the words of the people to the Lord. So they agreed. Their ancestors agreed. They agreed to this. And it was supposed to be carried over from, nation, from uh, generation to generation to generation. But, but as we went on down, went on down, they broke it. They didn't do it. So in uh, verse number 24, we see that the people also did not acknowledge that it was God who controlled the rains and the season. In the religion of Canaan, these aspects of nature lay under the control of Baal. So they believe Baal did it. So Jeremiah made the people angrier when he reminded them that it was God who should be referenced because he was the giver of the rains in their season. Their season, remember, was the autumn rain and they had the spring rain. So those were the rainy seasons up there. But <laughs> Jeremiah was trying to get them to remember that God is in control of all this. So, and it was also God who secured for his people the weeks appointed for the harvest, or the seven weeks, which were between the feast of the Passover and the feast of the weeks. If y'all want a reminder of the feast, let me know on your little paper, write it down so that I can get you those feasts and the Passovers and offerings and all that kind of stuff, because I gave it to you uh, some time ago. So at Passover, on the day after Sabbath, the priest presented the first sheaf of the harvest as a special gift to God. So that would be, you can find that in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 10 and 11, and it reads, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you enter the land that I am giving you and you reap its harvest, you shall bring the sheaf of the first fruit of your harvest to the priest. He shall raise the sheaf before the Lord that you may find acceptance. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall raise it. 
The, so now this same ritual was carried out at the Feast of Wheat. So you had the Feast of the Passover and the Feast of Wheat. So they did the same thing, but it was with a grain offering from the new crop, and that was presented to God. So Leviticus chapter 23, verse number 27 says, You should bring from your settlement two loaves of bread as an elevation offering, each made of two-tenths of an ephod. They should be choice flour, baked with leaven Lord. as first. So the first offering was of barley, and the second one was of wheat. So uh, the activity of God in making possible the maturing of the crop was thereby acknowledged because it was he who gave Israel her grain. So their ancestors recognized it up to a certain point. They just stopped recognizing it. They stopped giving God the recognition, knowing that God is, God, you know, is the reason for all things. But they chose to ignore this because they wanted to believe in these false gods that they were worshiping. So verse number 25, there appears to be a drought. The verse says, your iniquities have turned these away and your sins have deprived you of good. So Israel had wandered away from God and failed to reach the goal set for her. So these actions came from her disobedience and her uh, a rebellious heart. Remember, she's got this rebellious heart now. So uh, verses 26 and 29, 26 through 29, outline several specific evils or wickeds or evils that are like the ones we will find when we get to Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 2 through 15. That's very interesting over there, y'all. Y'all got to wait till we get there, though. So <laughs> and, and stuff, it gives you a longer version of this short version. Well, we will see the temple sermon by Jeremiah. Jeremiah, God is going to tell him to go up to the temple and preach to these people. And he's going to go up there and he's going to tell them a thing or two or three or four. So as we can see here in verse number 26, the word wicked is used to describe the people of Israel. Some of your Bibles may say evil, depending on which Bible you got, but they use wicked. These wicked men set out to trap their fellow men with the metaphor of a bird catcher being used throughout this passage. So verse number 27 reads, like a cage full of birds, their houses are full of treasury. So this seems to reference the ill-gotten or the improper gains which follow their fraud or their deceit. Because remember, they were being deceitful to these people. As a result, they had grown great, powerful, rich, fat, and sleek. So there also was no limit to their wicked deeds. They failed to plead the cause of the fatherless and they brought and bring about justice to their cases. So they failed to people. Um, the claims of the poor were ignored or neglected. The ch now, these are the poor people now we're talking about. They, that's different than they're, they're all poor. Da, da, da. These are the really, these are the, poverty, the, the people that are in poverty. They ignored them. They neglected them, and they were not supposed to be neglecting them. The charge seemed to be directed against the men who were supposed to bring aid to the needed people. So now we will see later when we get to Jeremiah chapter 7, where it says verse number 4, and we're going to see what these rich people are going to be shouting, that uh, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, uh, while ignoring the injustice of the land. So they're going to be, like I said, over here saying one thing, but over here doing another thing. The weak and helpless people came to them for help. But if there was not anything to gain by helping them, those in power did not help them. We see that a lot today, right? <laughs> if you can't get anything out of it, you ain't going to do nothing for them. So that's what we see that today. The rewards of justice remain with them while they gain power and control over those whom they, con uh, uh, whom they assisted. They can get something out of it. They did it. The leaders had somehow been able to fit in with Josiah's reform on the religious level so that they attended the temple and ceased to ascend the shrines while avoiding the deep ethical implications of the reform. So in other words, like we just said, they were showing outward things, like on the outside, they showing that, you know, we, we worshiping over here, we doing this over here, we doing all that for people, so they oppressed people, so the people could see them, so that they would continue to believe in them that, and to believe that they were in for their, be for their best, you know, uh, looking out for them. So they destroyed some of the shrines. They destroyed the shrines, but remember, they didn't tear down the high places. 
God had told them to tear down the high places. So they destroyed some of the shrines, you know, but they did not tear down the high places. So they were still being disobedient to God. Because they could be, they, you know, you know, we talked about how they created the idols. So we know how they made the idols out of the wood and, 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 and uh, what, fashioned it out and then covered it with gold or silver or whatever. That was easy to be done. So they left the high places. So, um, and, and all this was what they was, but when Josiah was there, he was trying to do all this. Then they killed him, or he, or he died in a battle with Egyptians. So the shrines were destroyed to minimize the nation's allegiance to Baal and to direct the people's loyalty once again to God and his covenant with, e, with Israel. That was the reform. That's what the reform called for. But God was the Lord of Israel their entire lives. And that's what they're seeming to forget. His will for his people was in the Ten Commandments. If God was not Lord of all, he was not Lord at all. If he was not Lord of all, he was not Lord at all. Because of their disobedience, Jeremiah again asked the same questions here in verse number 29 that he asked over in verse number 9. He asked them those two questions. Shall I not punish them for these things? And shall I not bring retribution on a nation such as this? And so you'll see if you go back and look at 29 and verse 9, they're the same, the exact same questions. So in verses 30 through 31, we see another sad sign of the situation that was going on over in Judah. It was the unholy alliance between the priests and the prophets. The discovery of the law book in the temple touched King Josiah personally and deeply. And you can read about that over in 2 Kings chapter 22, all the way through chapter, uh, well, through, uh, well, chapter 22, we begin with verse number 8. And then you go all the way through chapter 23, verse number 3. So, and you can read about King Josiah, how he found the book and all that. So, but what this book did, it gave the Israelites a standard by which they could check their traditions and make sure that they were doing the things that God commanded them to do. Because remember, the book was lost. The book of the law, the book that Moses wrote, that book was lost in the temple because it had already been attacked and all that, you know, and so rubble, all this kind of stuff. So it had been attacked and, 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 and stuff. So that was the first, that was, the, you know, when, when that was Solomon's temple that he had built. They had torn it all up and messed it all up, and the book was lost and stuff. So somebody during Josiah's time, they found the book, brought it to Josiah, so he reads the book. And that's why he wanted to do this reform, because he saw we're not doing things of God. We're not honoring what the Lord told us to do. We're not doing what we're supposed to be doing that our ancestors were doing. So that's why he started that, you know, he did this reformation. But the people did not want to do this. They didn't want to live by the commandments. They didn't want to do what thus says the Lord. So that's what all this was about. So uh, when, when, when Josiah, he found it, and he wanted to do those traditional things. He wanted to do the feast you know, the Passovers, all that. He wanted to do all that. These were long cherished privileges enjoyed by the priests and the princes, which were now in danger of being exposed because it required them to do certain things. It required these rich people to do certain things and to live a certain way. Because remember, they couldn't accept all this stuff. A king couldn't accept a bunch of horses that they were given. They were only allowed to have maybe one or two horses. But they had many horses and chariots. So they were going all against it. That's why they didn't want this book read. And then they were going to have to live a certain way. They didn't want this. So these powerful people couldn't be rich and powerful if they lived the way the book, you know, had told them to live. And they didn't want that. They couldn't uh, oppress the people any longer either. So now they were in danger of being exposed because Josiah had found this book. So any prophet's oracle might provide important clues to the proper interpretation of the law. The true prophet had no regard for vested interests or long cherished uh, privileges. He didn't care. He was not a howling. You know, he was not a howling. His task was to declare the mind of God regardless. You know, just like what Jeremiah was doing. Don't matter what these people think. This is what God said. This is what does said the Lord. But the lesser prophets or prophets that were that were howlings could give oracles which supported the status quo. I want to say what you want me to say because I want you to pay me off. So I'm going to say what you want me to say. Jeremiah addressed himself to a situation where the other pri- <laughs> prophets connived with the priests and spoke of in 
And she said it in verse number 30, an appalling and shocking thing in the land. And that namely was that the prophets prophesied falsely and the priests ruled as the prophets direct. They were what? What do you call it? Breaking off a piece for each other and stuff? Is that what you call that? <laughs> when they're helping each other, you know, and stuff, living, living and taking stuff from the oppressed people. They were oppressing the people, but they were working, what? Helping each other out. That's what they were doing. They gave support to the pop, prop, uh, popular element in contemporary religious life, which was happy to pay lip service to God and support the reforms at a surface level, but were unwilling to enter the deep commitment of life which should have characterized the covenant people. So in other words, they lived on the surface. Like I said, they were letting them see what they wanted them to see, but they were living like they wanted to live over here. So they were doing all these things they shouldn't have been doing, visiting to the, the uh, prostitutes, you know, or, or the harlots, you know, still going up there. So they still had all that going, except now they were doing it more in the brothels and stuff like that. So they were doing all this other, other kind of living, but yet I'm going to get before the people and look and sound like this. You know, so that's what they were doing. We see that today, too. So um, there, this was against what Jeremiah message for, was for the people. Uh, but Judah loved it. And that way, despite Jeremiah's pleading, they kept living like that. So Jeremiah asked this question. What will you do when the end comes? What will you do? It is assumed that he was referring to the judgment that was coming their way when the false teachings of the other prophets and the lives of the priests would be exposed for what they were. So he wasn't talking about the end time yet. He was talking about that judgment that they were going to be getting. You know, so he wasn't talking about the very end time. He was talking about what y'all going to do, you know, and then what are you going to do when you're exposed, when the people realize that you all are lying? That's going to be the end. What are y'all going to do? So the people love to believe that the words of the priests and the prophets gave the correct perspective. They believed in them. They knew that they were telling them the truth. But that's where, when she read that about it being uh, incomplete or the day had not come to a full stuff, that's what it meant. So it, 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 that their judgment was just going to be the judgment. That wasn't going to be the end time. This was going to be their judgment for what they were doing. So the day of repentance would have been the past at this time because uh, God had given them their chance to repent and they decided they didn't want to repent. They wanted to fool him and fool everybody. So now what were they going to do when their end came? What then of Jeremiah's quest for one man who acted justly or sought the earth? And, uh, uh, and we saw that back over in chapter 5, verse 1, and asked it again. We do not still in this chapter see indication, any indication that this man had been found. So we still hadn't found this faithful man yet. For three and a half centuries, the ark had rested at Jerusalem. That's when Josiah found that information he found. So for three and a half centuries, the ark had rested at Jerusalem, the place where God willed that his glory should dwell. Also, the line of kings descended from David had lived and ruled. So all this went on. All this has went on. There were many reasons why things might have been different. But Jeremiah looked in vain for one such man. Then finally, all he could do was to declare a message of doom. So all these centuries have passed, and they know this information. Josiah found the, the, the uh, information he found, the book of the law. They had all this. Then you had David, you know, the kings. You know, God had said this was going to happen, so you got a king. You know, over in Israel, you had a lot of different kings and all this kind of stuff. And over here in Judah, you had one line. They all came from David. So all this had happened just like what God had said. Everything that God said had came to pass, but they still, you know, did what they wanted to do. So now Jeremiah do, do have, could only issue them a message of doom. So the theme of impending judgment, which dominated chapters 4 and 5, which we read in chapters 4 and 5, was still <laughs> going to be at the forefront when we do chapter 6. <laughs> so we're going to still see some more doom and destruction because they still had not repented and they still had not changed. So... Next week, June the 14th, is Vacation Bible School. Yep, isn't it coming so fast? So we would not be having uh, uh, a Bible study because they'll be using this area for Vacation Bible School. We're going to have kids everywhere. So uh, next week we won't meet, but the following week we will be uh, in Chapter 6. 
So until next time, be blessed by God, be a blessing to others, be a person of God, share your love, share your faith, share God's word, and share the blessings that you receive from God with others each and every day. Amen, amen, and amen.